The appearance of Vice Imperator Polrum Krull on the view screen didn't surprise Proctor. She'd already recognized the ship, the magnanimity. The same Skiora ship she'd encountered with Granger aboard the ISS Warrior thirty years ago, and the same one she'd seen two weeks ago near San Martin. The same one with a giant, ISS Constitution-sized hole in it. Other unrepaired marks of battle scarred its hundred-kilometer-long hull, which seemed to fade away into the distance. She'd never get used to the sheer size of that thing, and regretted not developing the relationship with the matriarch, now sulking on the view screen, to the point where they could exchange more knowledge. Learn about their ship, their people, their society. War had cut short so many opportunities. Mother killer, why are you here? The words sliced her to the core, just as they had last time she had seen the matriarch near the now-destroyed moon of Elamine in the San Martin system. They cut even more deeply now that she'd lost her assistant, Ensign Flay, whom she'd felt directly responsible for. She died because Proctor was waiting to issue the order to self-destruct Civic's shuttle, stuck up inside the mysterious Golgothic ship, until they had squeezed as much information out of the sensor scans as possible, and given Lieutenant Civic more time to get away. That hesitation had cost not only Flay's life, but that of her unborn child and four other crew members who died during that space of twenty extra seconds. I'm here because we're under attack, and now I see that the Dolmasi have ceased their attack, coincidentally with your arrival. If I didn't know you any better, Vice Imperator, I'd suspect something. Suspect? Krull gave her best imitation of a human laugh. The diminutive bluish humanoid looked vaguely like an average human in a blue face mask, but she was unmistakably alien, with different customs, mannerisms, and facial expressions that Proctor, after half a dozen meetings over the years, had still not entirely figured out. She supposed it would take xenosociologists' generations to really understand them, if true understanding was even a possibility. And yet Krull spoke English, learned through her long connection to the swarm via the ligature. So perhaps understanding was not only possible, but inevitable. Krull continued, You need suspect nothing, Admiral Proctor. They disengage from the battle because they recognize in us a greater foe. The magnanimity alone is more powerful than all their ships here combined, by a factor of fifty at least. They disengage because they're waiting to see what happens, weighing whether they should attack or pull back and prepare for their next battle. Why? Why prepare for their next battle? Why are they attacking us? Krull shrugged, an exaggerated shrug as if she were mimicking the action knowing that it was what humans did when expressing a lack of knowledge, and yet so over-exaggerated as to suggest the Skiora's ignorance of the subtleties of human mannerisms. I was hoping you could tell me. Why are you attacking the ligature? The human attack on the ligature at Sangre de Cristo nearly destroyed it. It affected me. Even me. Terribly. To say nothing of what it did to my children, especially those within me. I can only suspect what terrible damage it has caused among the Dolmasi. And here you are, attacking it again. Why? I... I'm sorry, I didn't realize our actions were affecting the ligature itself. Not just the ligature, Admiral. You were prodding, barreling, tunneling directly into the Dolmasi psyche itself. All of us, all the beings connected by the ligature for the last several millennia, are now fully integrated into it. For the Skiora, for my people, it is natural. It is ours. We invented it. We grew with it and evolved with it over hundreds of thousands of years. But the swarm stole it and attached the Valarisi to it, then the Findiri and Quiasi, and finally the Dolmasi and the Adonasi other humans, the ones you call Russians. Are they still connected to it? No. She almost looked like she was smiling, which made her next statement all the more chilling. All the Adonisi that were connected to it were... purged. A sick feeling washed over her. 
I see. Granger alone was connected and lived, but then he disappeared, fell out of contact, out of range, or out of existence altogether. He didn't die? Depends on how you define death, she answered cryptically. One moment he was there, accessible through the ligature. Then he faded, and faded more. Until finally we could only just barely feel him, hear him, hear his thoughts like a whisper. Then nothing. It was too faint, like a shadow of a whisper, an echo of a whisper, and then an absence of a whisper. And yet the absence itself was... something. Proctor repeated the questions she'd asked the matriarch earlier at Elamine. Is he back? Can you feel him now? Has Granger returned? Krull laughed. Of course not. Singularities are one-way trips, I'm afraid. At least the naturally occurring kind are. And the penumbran black hole was as natural as they come. A star gone supernova sixty million years ago. Your artificial singularities, yes, they were true singularities, but they were artificial. The masses involved were minuscule compared to a star, and consequently they were traversable. Your people, admirably, have ceased research into them. Or at least that's what your government claims. But Granger, no. He went into that black hole, and we haven't felt him since. It took him years, decades, to fall towards that event horizon. Even when he was only detectable by microwaves and then radio waves, we could still feel him. But eventually the wavelength of his radio waves exceeded the dimensions of the event horizon itself, and he fell beyond our ken. The Ascension, said Proctor, using the oft-repeated words of the Grangerites. They might be crazy, but at least they had the science more or less correct. Once the radio waves originating as photons coming off the ISS Victory and Granger were stretched into radio waves and past the dimensions of the black hole itself, that meant he'd truly ascended, whatever that meant, passed through the event horizon, gone on to another universe, or rather his atoms. Nothing could survive that kind of gravitational stretching. Krull, two weeks ago we faced the mystery ship the one some of us called the Golgothic ship. We faced it and we thought we'd won, until it burrowed its way into one of our moons, Titan, and now that moon is growing, adding mass to itself deep inside the crust or the mantle. Honestly, our scans are so useless we can't even tell that much. Yes, we are aware of the situation. I'm afraid we are just as confused as you are, but I assure you, a substantial portion of my children are working on the problem. Proctor nodded and continued. But what you might not be aware of is what our sensor scans picked up inside that ship right before it blew. It picked out the letters ISSVIC, which I believe is part of the hull nameplate of the ISS Victory. The ship Granger's ship, interrupted Krull. Interesting. Very, very interesting. I think, Vice Imperator, that is as big an understatement that I've ever heard. But that's not all. We ran the isotopics. The tungsten from that nameplate came from the victory, all right. But what was puzzling was that the isotopic signature would indicate that it is over thirteen billion years old. Krull stared at her, unmoving, unspeaking. If she thought the claim incredible, she gave no clue. You heard me, matriarch. Did that translation come through? Thirteen billion years? The universe itself is only thirteen point eight billion years old. I heard, Admiral, and I have no answer. Black holes are curious things. Just like with your artificial singularities, there are some of my children that theorize they connect different parts of our universe. I believe your technical term is 
Einstein, Rosen, Bridges. Wormholes. Exactly. You're suggesting that Granger went through a wormhole? I suggest nothing. To go through a wormhole implies that Granger, assuming he was alive when he went through, went to another location within our universe, possibly up to billions of light years away. If so, we would have felt him through the ligature. It connects all points in the universe instantaneously. But I have other children that theorize one can traverse the fabric, the boundary, of the universe itself and end up in another reality. The physics are complicated, but solutions to the equation exist that take one to another non-causally connected universe. Which one? Kroll did her exaggerated shrug again. There are endless numbers of universes. Reality knows no bounds. We know that the swarm came from but one of those universes, but that is the extent of our knowledge of any universe other than our own. So you're saying that Granger could have gone to the swarm's universe? Proctor felt the irrational hope spring up within her, and she inwardly chided herself. She sounded like a deluded Grangerite. Face it, Shelby. What's lost is lost. Look to the future, not the past. Again, Mother Killer, I am saying, suggesting, nothing. My children theorize much. They spend their days thinking. I have a small group of five children that are convinced that Granger is indeed a god, like your upstart religion claims. I have another group of four children that solve human word puzzles all day. One child, one of my oldest, is on an endless search for the largest prime number. He's convinced there is one. Children do... the oddest things. I tell you this, these possibilities for Granger's final resting place only as a way to... What's your term? Brain... storm? I have no idea what happened to him. No idea why a piece of the victory ended up on that alien ship. But I think you're right. Solving that puzzle is essential to understanding our other problems. Proctor sighed. Like the Dolmasi. Kral frowned. No, Mother Killer. The Dolmasi's problems are almost entirely human-caused. And I have not brought the magnanimity here to save you from the Dolmasi. I've come here to tell you to stop. Stop interfering with the ligature. You play with forces you don't understand, things you can't possibly comprehend. Matriarch, I assure you, I have no idea what happened over Sangre de Cristo, but you know what happened here, at Malprime. You've been prodding them, trying to disrupt them, keep them off balance with metaspace spikes in an effort to gain advantage over them in battle. I... Yes she conceded. I did so without realizing the long-term consequences. I apologize. But, Matriarch, we need help with this problem. If I am ever to have time to divert my attention to the issue of that alien ship that is now transforming Titan into something else, then I need help with the Dolmasi issue now. Krull shook her head slowly. Mother Killer, I am not here to fight your petty wars for you. After I help you with the Dolmasi, would you then require my help against your renegade Admiral Mullins? And after that, would you require my help to go finally subdue your pirates and slavers? Or would you like to resume your endless wars with the Russian Confederation? Believe me, Admiral Proctor, there is no end of ways we could help you with war. Because that is your nature and we will not enable it. My people have been preparing for the last thirty years to re-embark on our mission of galactic exploration. There is so much to discover and learn about the universe, about existence and reality itself. The last thing we want is to get bogged down fighting in human wars. Proctor felt a surge of jealousy. Galactic exploration. That's exactly what IDF should be doing, 
exploring the stars, meeting new civilizations and building relationships across the galaxy, exchanging knowledge and technology. Instead, we get jackasses like Mullins and Oppenheimer. And not just jealousy. It was a little irritating to be lectured by an alien that enabled the rise of the swarm in their galaxy, even if that help was coerced. At least, at least help us talk to them. If we could only talk to them, get them to see we don't want to fight them, I'm afraid you admitting that you don't want to fight them would only embolden them. They are a vigorous race. In your travels, I'm sure you've encountered the remains and traces of dozens of civilizations destroyed by the swarm. But it wasn't the swarm that destroyed them. Each race the swarm came upon, it judged. It judged whether they were worthy of incorporation into the ligature, into their family, as they called it. But most civilizations were found wanting. They were judged to be too inferior. And in those cases, the swarm sent in the Domasi. And the result, every single time, was destruction. Complete, utter destruction. I'm afraid your problem is more serious than you thought, Mother Killer. The Domasi won't stop until humanity is either destroyed, or they are convinced that you are too strong to conquer. There is no middle ground with them. Up until now, they had thought you were too strong to conquer. Apparently that has changed. A chill up Proctor's spine once more. Please, matriarch! Something, anything to help us communicate! Krull hesitated. At least that was what Proctor interpreted the body language to mean. I'm afraid we do not know the Dolmasi tongue. Really? Proctor was genuinely surprised. But you know ours. You could communicate with the swarm when they were still here. We could. Through the ligature, we essentially spoke swarm. We spoke with the Dolmasi in the swarm communication protocol. Again, always through the ligature. We never had a reason to learn the Dolmasi's language. But humanity, we had to learn your tongue. And frankly, it was easy. The swarm consumed several individuals of your people and assimilated knowledge of English, Chinese, Russian, French, German, and a few other human languages. And through the ligature, those tongues were taught to me almost instantly. It was necessary to ease humanity's assimilation into the family, the Concordat of Seven, as they called it. After the First Swarm War over a hundred years ago, the swarm gave us the task of preparing humanity's entry into the family. And so, we spent seventy-five years laying the groundwork, working behind the scenes, so to speak, to bring you into the ligature. But that is irrelevant history. What matters now is stopping the Domasi, then understanding this new alien threat that is altering your moon, Titan. A thought occurred to Proctor. Is there a chance the alien ship that burrowed into Titan is Findiri or Kuyasi? We've still heard nothing about either race in thirty years of searching. The reply came quickly. No. Are you sure? I'm sure, Mother Killer, beyond any doubt. They are both a great distance away from us here, and I will speak no more of them. Why not? Krull looked like she was struggling. Because. Because is all. Some latent command by the swarm, some thing they implanted in all of us, forbids me from even contemplating them. How very odd. Krull continued. But this I know. The ship that crashed into Titan has nothing to do with them. It is something new, something we have no knowledge of. And it is not something I wish to become involved with. Neither it nor your Dolmasi problem. But can you... Krull interrupted her. As I said, we will not intervene. But perhaps I can help you communicate with them, as you asked. What can you do for us? The hesitation was unmistakable this time. What Krull was about to say was clearly uncomfortable for her. I will give you... 
The Keys to the Ligature Chapter 14 Britannia Sector, Britannia, Outskirts of Whitehaven Nile Holdings Incorporated Warehouse When Keene finally saw the customer, he did a double-take. From the subtext of his supervisor's words, he'd have expected to meet a well-heeled plutocrat, a trillionaire looking to supply his estates with a lifetime supply of whatever it was trillionaires kept in stock, booze, fluff coke, women. Nile Holdings Incorporated didn't supply either of those, though Keene was sure it had subsidiaries or corporate partners that did. He did a double-take because the customer had no face at all. Rather, he, or she, wore a mask. Like a gas mask or pressure suit helmet whose face shield was tinted with a mirror finish. And the voice. Half the amount should have transferred by now, Mr. Joe Rochelle. The bank's representative tells me he just made the transfer moments ago. The voice was almost robotic. Either he had a voice implant or the helmet was adding distortion to his voice. This person definitely did not want to be found out. Which meant the payoff would be even higher. Keene smiled. Shit, he'd not only be able to buy his own nudie bar, but his own penthouse in Whitehaven. Maybe even go back to Earth. Get an estate out in Tennessee or a penthouse in Seattle or New York. Joe, his manager, checked his hand terminal and smiled. Indeed, the transfer is complete. He looked over at Keene with wide eyes, trying not to let the customer see his glee. He passed the hand terminal to Keene and turned back to the customer to go over a few more details. Keene glanced at the device, which was still connected to the warehouse's corporate bank account. One hundred million dollars. Holy shit. Granted, most of that belonged to the company, but damn. The bonus would be astronomical, and he checked to make sure. Yep, that included a generous tip. A million dollars each for him and his supervisor. Five hundred grand for the secretary. That alone would be enough to pay off all his debts and buy a new house there in Whitehaven. Best day ever. He cleared his throat. I'll get to work right away on the shipment, Mr... He turned to his supervisor for help with the name, trying to suppress the urge to laugh, grin, shout, to grab the customer by the hand and shake it right off. Anyway, uh, what are the goods? The customer answered for him. Gallium. Gallium. Huh. Interesting. How much? Ten kilos? A hundred? All of it. Keen paused for a moment, trying to remember how much supply they had. Basic chemicals, compounds, and elements was one of Nile Holding Inc.'s specialties. They supplied all the government research labs and industrial research partnerships. Uh, all of it. I think we have over 50 metric tons of the stuff. I don't know if all of it. One million dollars, plus the bonus, which he still hadn't even bothered to calculate yet. Probably another two million on top of that. Right away, sir. I'll have it all ready by the end of business tomorrow. No, I want it tonight. Stay all day, all night if you have to. That gallium needs to be on a cargo hauler immediately and not a moment later. Understood? He shook his head, repeating the mantra in his head. Three million dollars, three million dollars, three million dollars. Understood. I'll get it done by the end of the day. Destination? The stranger shook his head. You don't need to know. Joe Rochelle demurred. Well, we don't need to know an exact location, but the distance will determine what kind of cargo hauler we use. Is this somewhere on planet, here on Britannia, or out to Calais, or one of the stations in system, or Earth, farther? Farther. That's all I'll say. Keen shook his head, still repeating the mantra in his head. Oh, very well, I'll transfer it into one of our long-range haulers. We'll use the Angry Betty. She's got the most powerful Q-jumpers of all our ships. Get you there in a pinch. The customer shook his head. It'll get you there in a pinch. This is a delivery. I don't have the time to come along for the ride. 
I've got other things to be doing. The customer handed him a data pad of other specifications for the order. What kind of container to be used, some kind of dispersal and aerosolization equipment, simple orbital thrusters for the container. Apparently this was to be moved around in orbit for at least part of its journey. Whatever, the money was good. More than good, it was astronomical. A customer could have demanded the gallium delivered in a thousand gold-plated douchebags, and neither Keen nor Rochelle would have bat an eyelash. Payday was coming, baby. Chapter 15 Orbit over Mal Prime, Lieutenant Zivik's Cockpit The recovery ship was going to be too late. Ace was running out of time. Zivik knew that if the loss of blood was great enough to make her pass out, death was soon to follow. He had to do something now. Okay, Ace, hold on tight. Sarbird's coming, he said. The backup power cells were still full, and he did something that under normal circumstances might be considered extremely foolish. He dumped all the reserve power into the auxiliary thrusters. Before he gunned the accelerator, he checked to make sure the tow line connecting him to Ace's bird was still intact. It was. It spanned the twenty meters separating them, taut. Batship, we're detecting old power readings from your— began the deckhand. Tell the SAR that I'm meeting them halfway. More than halfway if I can manage it. He gunned the thrusters. The extreme forces shoved him deep into his seat, and he finessed the controls to minimize the whiplash on Ace's bird. Before he knew it, they were nearly there. Search and Rescue was only just departing the Independence's flight deck, and before he crashed into either of them, he swung his hobbled fighter around and used up the last of the backup power cells to slow them down enough for the rescue team to latch onto them. Batship, we're detecting you just used the last of your reserves, and that you've lost life support. It's okay, I'm on suit life support. I'll be fine for a few minutes. Just get Ace the hell out of here. It took far longer than he would have liked, but the recovery vehicle latched onto both of them and gently towed them down onto the flight deck of the Independence. He jumped out of his cockpit before the hatch could even get halfway open and sprinted toward Ace's ruined bird. The recovery team was already pulling her out. She was a bloody mess. Shit. Shit, 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 he repeated in his mind. The medics were strapping her to a gurney and injected her with something before they rushed her out the door. He sprinted close behind, ignoring the searing pain in his ankle. When did that happen? Had he somehow injured himself during the mission? Didn't matter. All that mattered was saving the girl, being the hero. Damn it. Was he falling for that girl? What was it with him and falling for women he rescued? Before he knew it, they were at sickbay, and he followed them into the surgical ward. A nurse blocked his path. That's far enough, Lieutenant. But I said... She stared him down. That's far enough. You did your job. Now let us do ours. The door shut, and all he could do was pace the wall, trying to peer around the blinds that had been drawn across the window into the surgical ward. Damn it. It was too late, wasn't he? Sarah Batak, dead. That kid he'd left behind on Ido's research station, dead. And now he was going to lose another one. Chapter 16 She knew she was dreaming, but as always Proctor couldn't stop the familiar sequence from proceeding. It went like clockwork, inexorable and incontestable. That shot is one in a million, Shell, her sister said. And she was right. Shelby peered through her scope at the bird off in the distance, perched on the branch of an acacia tree on the savanna. Its plumage was a wild shade of purple mixed with yellows and fiery oranges. She wasn't even sure it was a real species of bird. Sometimes the simulator got creative. They called it an elf bird, since its hooked beak and inquisitive face reminded them of what an elf from certain fantasy novels might look like. But for now, that bird was real, and she was going to hit it. Whether it was two meters away or... She checked the rangefinder on her rifle. Two hundred meters away. She thumbed a few more beads on her rosary and mumbled the custom prayer she'd come up with for occasions like this on her virtual hunting trips with Carla. Hail Mary, 
full of grace, help me shoot that bird's fat face. Hail Mary, full of grace, help me shoot, Carla grimaced. I told you to stop that. Mom said it was blasphemous. You're blasphemous, Car. You're messing up my shot. In the Church of the Holy Shooting Range, that's worse than calling a magazine a clip. Carla's grimace turned into a sly smile, and she leaned in close to Shelby's ear, even as she began to pull the trigger. One in a million, she whispered. The trigger pulled, the shot went wide, and the bird flew away with a flurry of flaps and squawks. Purple and yellow feathers drifted down in a cloud to the branch where the bird had been perched. Shelby turned to Carla and swore. Damn it, Car! I had it and you ruined it! Carla giggled as only a twelve-year-old could. It's not even a real rifle. Just adjust the auto-aim controls on the program and get this over with. Come on, I want to go home. I'm feeling tired. Shelby scowled. In a few minutes, I want to hit that damn elf bird. Stop swearing. You know Mom hates it. She'll make you say a hundred more Hail Marys tonight. Shelby smirked. Only if you tell on me again. Come on, Car, I'm fourteen. I can swear all I want. She settled back into her aiming position, which the computer automatically detected, and summoned the purple and yellow plumaged elf bird again. In the back of her mind, Shelby wondered what kind of bird it really was. Something exotic, no doubt. Something from the lush savannas of Britannia or Cadiz. Those worlds always had the prettiest birds. It flew in from the canopy of branches to alight on its previous perch and began preening itself. Okay, Car. Here we go, one in a million. Prepare to be amazed. She bit her lip, repeated her silent, blasphemous prayer again, and squeezed the trigger. Missed. Damn it! Shelby pounded the giant fallen tree she'd been leaning against for balance. Okay, one more and I'll... She turned to her sister to convince her to stay for another few minutes. But Carla was on the ground, sprawled among the fallen brown leaves. Several were caught up in the tangle of her wild hair. Her eyes were closed. Carla, are you napping on the job? Come on, you're supposed to be helping. She trailed off when she saw the trickle of blood coming from the girl's nose. Car, Carla! She shook her sister, but she didn't wake up. And even in her dream, she realized that moment was when the decades of nightmares began. Chapter 17 Earth, Lower Manhattan, United Earth Presidential Mansion Agent Pratt, get the hell out of my way. President Frederick Quimby III thought himself a man of the people. Capital M and capital P. After all, when you win your election in a landslide vote, taking 49 out of 62 worlds and nearly 50 billion votes, it's easy to think people love you. It's easy to interpret the crowds of millions at your rallies as a show of love for you, and not a show of revulsion for your opponent. And so, when the alien ship had shown up last month and thrown his celebrity-filled calendar for a loop, actually forcing him to meet with his generals and intelligence officials, he was beyond pissed. Not just at the modest loss of life and the loss of the ISS Chesapeake, but the fact that the Secret Service now objected to every single one of his usual activities. No more glad-handing the crowds, no more jogs through Central Park, dropping in unexpectedly at fast food restaurants to grab a burger or curry and a photo op with regular Joe voters. He was the most powerful man in the galaxy and he was a prisoner. Sir, said Agent Carter, I can't allow you to leave the presidential grounds without your motorcade. He filled the doorway of the presidential mansion's rear exit with his massive frame. Bull honky, malarkey. I'm the goddamn president of United Earth. More people voted for me as their leader in the history of civilization than anyone else. I'll do what I fucking want. He tried to get around him. Come on, Cal. He called behind him to his body man, Calvin Quinkert. We're going on this jog whether Tiny here wants me to or not. Tiny, Agent Carter didn't budge, but rather stretched his arms out to completely bar the door. 
Congratulations on your life-affirming election victory, sir, but I'm still not moving. Please wait for the motorcade and the rest of the security detail. Quimby held a finger up to the man's nose. I'm not going on a run with ten goddamned armored vehicles following me, or with twenty Secret Service agents that can't keep up. Before Agent Carter had time to respond, the hallway filled up with presidential aides, followed by his chief of staff. God damn it. Sir, Mr. Bird began. Can I get twenty minutes, Mick? Mick Bird, the chief of staff, shook his head solemnly. Always so solemn. Like a goddamn graveyard groundskeeper. Why the hell did he hire this guy? Right, his rich asshole of a veep, John Sepulveda, the sixth or eighth or some bullshit, insisted his cousin get a plum job, paying his political debts. Sorry, sir, it's Fleet Admiral Oppenheimer. He's in your office. Quimby let out a defeated sigh. Fine. He allowed Agent Carter to escort him back to the executive office suite, his body man in tow, followed up by Bird and his aides. Shit, it's like a circus wherever I go. When he stepped back into his office, Oppenheimer rose to greet him. Dark circles ringed his lower eyelids. It was clear the head of IDF had gotten little sleep over the past few weeks. Mr. President, we have a situation. Another one. Quimby collapsed into his desk chair, accepting his defeat. Maybe tomorrow he'd make it out for his run. He bent down to take his running shoes off and slipped the loafers back on. Maybe he could turn back time to three months ago and throw the election to his opponent. Being president had turned out to be awfully... inconvenient. Proctor is at it again, defying orders, going rogue, and this time she's fraternizing with the Sciora without authorization. Quimby waved a hand impatiently, rubbing his temple with the other. Slow down, slow down, back up. Did the operation work, the metaspace pulse? Oppenheimer made a face. That's what I'm telling you, she's defiant. I ordered her to hit the Dolmasi ships with it, and she did at first, but only at one-tenth power before giving up completely and running off to beg the Skiora for help. Wait, she actually left Mal Prime, tracked down the Skiora, and brought them back to the battle? Oppenheimer shrugged. Well, no, not exactly. The Skiora ship Magnanimity showed up halfway through the battle. That's the same one Granger and Proctor dealt with back in the Second Swarm War, right? Correct, sir. The one the Constitution collided with in the war. It showed up, and Proctor started unauthorized talks with them and convinced them to get the Dolmasi to stand down. Quimby leaned forward. So, and help me out here, Admiral. She defused the situation? That sounds like a win to me. Can I go running now? Oppenheimer's face seemed to be getting redder and redder, as if he found it beneath himself to be explaining military matters to a civilian. It means, Mr. President, that the main force of the Dolmasi escaped. They initiated aggressive action against us, and right when we were on the cusp of victory, Proctor let them escape. Oh, God, the dick-wagging. President Quimby folded his fingers patiently on his desk. So, it sounds like we have a second rogue admiral on our hands. Except this one seems to be in the business of stopping wars, not profiting off of them. Tell me, have you sacked Mullins yet? A pause, and when he answered, his voice was ice. The situation has not changed, Mr. President. Oppenheimer clearly did not like talking about the Mullins situation. It showed on his face, in his voice. We can't just relieve him of duty. As the virtual head of Shovik Orion, the chaos he could cause in all our military systems is unthinkable. Would he do that? A month ago I would have said no. I would have said Mullins was a patriot, who would never think of doing something so brazen and callous, but now? Oppenheimer scowled and folded his arms. I'm already working on an exit plan a way to reduce our dependence on the Shovik Orion-produced military systems so that when we do cut him loose, the damage he could cause would be greatly reduced. But unfortunately, that plan is years off. Rewriting software and reverse engineering almost every system on our fleet ships is no small undertaking. Plus, we have to do it covertly, so the bastard doesn't find out and lose his shit. Quimby waved a hand impatiently. Okay, okay, we've discussed this all before. 
Why are you here? Explain to me why I don't get to go on my run today. Proctor, as I said, she's, yes, yes, she's a defiant bitch, but she's a war hero, Christian. She's earned her right to be a free-range admiral. Not when she endangers the mission. Oppenheimer was clearly getting agitated. And what mission is that? Winning the war against this new alien threat, the, the gold gothics or whatever their name is? I think her track record on winning wars of alien aggression is already quite established by now. In my first intel briefing, I learned that it was actually Proctor that tracked down the last swarm ship over twenty years ago and annihilated it. Now, tell me, can I go on my run? Oppenheimer sighed. Mr. President, I think it's time I... laid it all out for you. The Admiral talked like a man at the poker table about to reveal all his cards and unsure that his bet fit the hand. This ought to be good. You mean you haven't laid it all out for me before now? You realize I'm the goddamned commander-in-chief, right? It's because it's more of a hunch. But somewhat based on raw intel, highly classified intel. A month simply isn't enough time to brief you on every piece of intel we have or on the incredibly complex details of our history with the Swarm and its attendant races. You see, I believe the new alien ship, the Golgothics, was... Sorry, let me back up. He stood and started to pace. When the swarm hit us the first time over a hundred years ago, it was simple. Aliens attacking us, we fight back, and, for no apparent good reason, they give up. They leave, we win. But then, thirty years ago, they came back. Quimby nodded. That's well understood, I thought. The orbital cycle of the black hole in the penumbra system with its red dwarf companion opened the metaspace... the... Rift into whatever universe the swarm came from, every hundred and fifty years. Except the Russians, at the time headed by President Malikov, opened it prematurely with the artificial singularity tech, giving us the gift of Swarm War II. My dad was president of the Senate at the time, told me all about it. Correct. But you're leaving out some of the history. In Swarm War I, it was just the swarm. It was simple. One enemy. Everything was clear-cut apart from the usual political and diplomatic bullshit with the Russians, Chinese, and the Caliphate. But in Swarm War II, all of a sudden the Domasi show up, a race that claimed to be under the control of the Swarm until they coincidentally figured out how to free themselves from Swarm influence. And then, wouldn't you know it, the Skiora show up a month after that with some sketchy bullshit story about how Granger's actions at the Battle of New Dublin somehow magically freed them from swarm control as well. Quimby hesitated. I hadn't heard that part. How did he do it? Granger, freeing them from the swarm. Doesn't matter. Has to do with the interaction between the ligature, uh, the metaspace link all the swarm-affiliated races used to talk to each other behind our backs, and the Russian singularity tech. Something about mixing quantum mechanics, what the ligature depends on, with general relativity which governs the singularities. But the important part that stands out to me is this. When the Sciora showed up, they told Granger that the Swarm family was made up of not one, not two, not three, but seven races. The Concordat of Seven, they called them. Quimby grit his teeth and gripped the edge of his desk. Why isn't this common knowledge? Why wasn't I told? I'm telling you now. You're a new president, and frankly, there's just a lot of shit to catch you up on. Takes time, Mr. President. And if we were to tell the general population that there were seven alien races out there, my God, can you imagine the panic? It's bad enough with just the Dolmasi and the Skiora lurking out there. Good thing they generally keep to themselves, or things would be worse. Yes, definitely should have thrown the election. Quimby leaned back in his chair and kicked his feet onto his desk. So, who are the rest of the seven? Oppenheimer held up his fingers as he listed them off. One, the liquid Valerisi, who we used to think of as the Swarm, but just turned out to be a race the Swarm had corrupted and controlled, and who are now completely extinct, thanks to our friend Shelby Proctor. Two, the actual metaspace Swarm, we call them the beings who extended their influence through the Penumbran Black Hole and took over the Valerisi thousands of years ago. Three, the Sciora, 
four, the Dolmasi, and five, the Adonisi, that was the swarm's name for us, humans, at least the humans they brought under their control, mostly the Russian high command at the time. Shit, Quimby breathed, and are, are they still under swarm control? Oppenheimer scowled as if he were lecturing a child. Quimby made a mental note to replace the asshole at the earliest opportunity. Of course not. The metaspace swarm is gone. Granger sealed the penumbra link permanently with a bunch of President Avery's antimatter bombs. And the Russians did what Russians do best. There was a huge purge right after the war. Malikov basically disappeared the entire high command and replaced them. You can probably guess where the old ones went. Siberia? Or worse, Canada? Anyway, that leaves two races, the Findiri and the Quiasi. Who are they? Where are they? Oppenheimer finally stopped pacing and turned to face the president. His look was grave. We... don't know. What do you mean, we don't know? We don't know. But I have my suspicions. Allow me to lay them out for you. He pulled out a holoprojector data pad and began displaying a slick, flashy presentation on the wall of his office. High production value. It almost seemed Oppenheimer had scripted the entire conversation, at least his half of it, and he seemed to know in advance what Quimby's responses would be, and the president felt played because of it. Damn it, don't they know who the hell I am? No, stop, I'm not sitting through a whole presentation. Just give me the conclusion. Get to the point, Admiral. Crestfallen, Oppenheimer clicked the projector off and cleared his throat. Long story short, I ordered Admiral Proctor to get out to the periphery sectors to investigate a few leads related to my suspicions about the Findiri and the Quiasi. She refused. Given her actions at the Battle of Mao Prime, I have reason to suspect that she is under their influence. Quimby laughed. Imp Possible. The Admiral Proctor, the quote unquote companion of the hero of Earth, under the influence of some alien race? I don't mean to go all Grangerite on you, Admiral, but if it ever got out that I was somehow against Proctor, I'd lose half the votes on Earth, San Martin, Britannia, and half a dozen other worlds. There's not that many actual full on crazy Grangerites, but she's damn popular. Even more so now that she's been called back into service. Don't tell me you're having second thoughts about bringing her back. As I recall, it was your idea. Oppenheimer grunted at the reminder. I didn't anticipate Shelby being so... Stubborn. I thought I could control her more than... Quimby snorted. Control? Christian, it took me four wives to figure out you can't control them. The fleet admiral made a face. Mr. President, with all due respect, Proctor and I are not married. And your many marriages are nothing like, of course you are. You're married to your job, Christian. Everyone knows it, and by extension with Proctor, it's like you're now dating an ex-wife of yours, loving and hating every minute of it, fighting, reopening and rehashing old arguments, gossiping about each other behind their backs. Please don't tell me you two are fucking. Oppenheimer was turning red, and Quimby couldn't tell if it was from embarrassment or anger. Good. Let him feel both. It gets the control back where it belongs, with Mr. President. The Admiral started to protest, but Quimby held up a hand to stop him. Kidding, Christian. Take the stick out of your ass. Look, it sounds like we both have similar problems. We each have a rogue Admiral on our hands. Consider this my official permission to go do something about yours while I go handle mine. The meaning of his statement began to dawn on Oppenheimer. You mean... I can relieve Proctor? Of course not. Politics, remember? But you can... persuade her to follow your lead? As long as I don't hear about it. Besides, I've got a rogue admiral of my own to put in his place. This one is above your pay grade, I believe. He stood up, and with a knowing glance to Quinker at his body man, the kid immediately left to go gather the president's personal belongings for a quick interstellar trip. What are you going to do? I told you if we piss him off and Chovic Orion decides it no longer wishes to service our starships, don't shit your pants, Christian. I got this. I just won the biggest election in galactic history, remember? 
I persuade people. I get them to think we're on the same side. It's what I do. He'll find I can be very persuasive, and in the end he'll back off and he'll think it was his idea. He walked out of his office, leaving the admiral behind. The other man's face clearly looked like he wanted to talk more, but Quimby both didn't care and also wanted to leave the impression that he was the alpha dog, driving the conversation in control of the situation. It would piss the admiral off, sure, but then Quimby would heap some public praise on the asshole and puff up the blustery, shallow ego. It's how he neutered and controlled the most powerful political leaders that ended up endorsing him. Play them like fiddles. Their fragile egos were his piano. And where are we going, Mr. President? asked Quinkert. Bolivar, to have a few choice words with Mr. Mullins. And what were those words going to be? Hell if he knew. He had a day-long interstellar voyage to figure that part out. Shoot from the hip, that's why people loved him. Maybe a few beers would be all it took to loosen Mullins up a little. Or giving him a fat payoff, it worked for him before. Or give him a planet. Shit, whatever it took. He sure as hell wasn't going to be a sideshow to some megalomaniac admiral. Much less three of them. Chapter 18 Orbit Over Mal Prime ISS Independence Bridge There was an unwritten order of things. Every social situation, every locale where humans gathered into social structures. There were always law codes and regulations and rules, and inevitably, there was the stuff that happened under the table. And in the military, Proctor mused to herself as she walked into the bar, that under-the-table stuff often happened right there on top of the table, in full view of everyone. Like the bar itself. She smiled lopsidedly at the name stenciled on the archway to the converted storage room near the fighter bay. Futwicks. She knew there was a joke in there somewhere. She knew for sure there was no crew member named Futwick aboard the ship. She flipped a chair around at a table and sat in it backwards. Captain Valls was already there, glass half empty. Usually she would have said it was half full, but such were the times. She noticed several other officers and pilots stand up in respect once they'd noticed her, and she waved them back down. The unwritten order allowed the existence of the unofficial bar next to the fighter bay, but the written order still required standard courtesy and protocol. Palsy? Been here a while? She indicated his half-full glass, while simultaneously catching the attention of the barkeeper, who this shift looked to be one of the fighter deckhands. Less than two minutes. He held the glass up and gulped the rest of the beer down. It's been a hell of a day. Did the last of the Dolmasi ships finally leave? She nodded. A few of them hung around, staying well beyond Mal Prime's moon, but they finally Q-jumped away. Palram Krull finally saw a reason and agreed to keep the magnanimity in the system until the last Dolmasi ship left. And the independence? What's our itinerary? Valls waved at the deckhand to hurry up. Admiral Soon from the CIDR fleet asked that we stay a while, at least until the magnanimity leaves. The Sciora make them nervous, and Soon thinks I've got cachet with them, that if I'm around, the Sciora will behave themselves. Valls grinned half-heartedly. They don't step out of line with the mother killer around. She shot him a glare. That was uncalled for, Ballsy. Sorry. Valls looked sheepish. She wondered if that glass was his first. Though, by unwritten order, the drinks they served there had to be lower alcohol content than usual. The deckhand finally came over with another glass full of the watered-down beer for Valls and looked at her questioningly. She glanced at his name tag. Rydberg. Ma'am? Coffee, cream, and sugar, please. And Yeoman Rydberg? Ma'am. Extra strong? By the look on his face, he knew what extra strong meant. She couldn't officially be asking for Irish coffee, after all. He saluted and retreated behind the bar to prepare her drink. I assume you'll speak at the memorial service? Valls downed another half of his new glass. She paused several moments, sighed. Of course. 
How many pilots? Did Sanders make it? He was in intensive care earlier. Valls shook his head. No. Batship just told me he passed. The burns were too extensive. Lost too much blood. Proctor held her head in her hands. Damn. She didn't even notice the deckhand place the coffee in front of her. It was there when she finally looked up. How many? Nine. She gulped several swallows of coffee, relishing the burn, welcoming its fire and the accompanying warmth of alcohol. She could have been one of the nine. Any of them could. But for now, she was alive and she savored it, all while feeling the pain of losing her people. People who were her responsibility, people who wouldn't go home to their kids and wives and husbands and parents. Damn, she repeated. Death is life, Shelby. We've all got to go. Question is when. At least those folks went out for a cause and went fast. We can only hope for as much for ourselves. A cause? And what cause was that? He didn't have an answer. They sat in silence for a minute. She glanced over to the table next to them, full of enlisted men and women, mechanics by the look of them, and nodded a greeting. They gave nodded salutes back. That ship? Which pilot is that? My son. Proctor's eyebrows went up. I thought his was bat shit. Falls grinned. Good. They needed something to laugh at, so she'd laugh at whatever he found funny. Anything to distract them, even for a moment, from the awful realities of war. It was. Until you tamped down on the, quote, potty language two weeks ago. Ah. Bat ship. She glanced back up at the sign on the wall. Fut wicks. She shook her head. You people. Pilots. Fighter jocks. There's not a rule or regulation you people won't sidestep around. Valls grinned even wider. If we didn't, there'd never be places like Fut wicks. She raised her cup. And God bless you for it. Valls looked sidelong at her, stroking his stubble goatee. Another unwritten rule, officers in war could look like whatever the hell they wanted to, as long as they got shit done. You could have just changed it all when you were fleet admiral, you know. And why would I do a batship stupid futwick thing like that? She sipped the coffee, feeling the Irish whiskey finally kick in a little bit. Valls grunted. No more of this sidestepping rules shit. Just have it all out in the open, you know. He finished his second and final beer. The deckhand had caught his attention with a questioning glance, but Valls waved him off. Absolutely not. It happens anyway, Shelby. May as well be up front about it. I mean, come on. He waved an arm around towards the storage bay turned pub with a look that said, Gotcha. Here you are. She sipped another mouthful. Here I am. And I wouldn't have it any other way. Ballsy, I never had kids but I had my little brother and sister and nieces and nephews, and I've commanded thousands of twenty-something kids over the years. And the one thing I've learned about humans, young people in particular, is that they, we, have to rebel against something. It's in our blood. It's our evolutionary and cultural heritage. If we're not rebelling against something, by God, we'll soon find something to rebel against. And I, for one, would far prefer to channel that rebellion into something beautiful like Futwicks than something terrible like whatever you people would do if this place were officially sanctioned. A uh, fight club? She smirked. Don't push your luck, Captain. She downed the last mouthful. It's human nature. Defiance, rebellion. It's what gave us Magna Carta. It's what gave us the American Revolution, the French Revolution, the women's suffrage movement. It's what gave us the People's Accord that ended the First Interstellar War, on and on and on. It's what gave us bloody Tim Granger and the defeat of the Swarm. At the mention of the name, the mood went darker. But they're back, Vols said. We don't know that. Shelby, they're coming, he quoted to her. That could mean anything. He stared her in the eye. Or it could mean exactly what we think it means, exactly what we know it means. I know. Damn it, I know, but ballsy. Thirteen billion years? How the hell is that even possible? It flies in the face of all reason. 
Tim always did have a knack for flying in the face of reason. You could say it was his defining quality. Proctor snorted. His defining quality was being a crotchety old man who grumbled. Constantly. And now he's a god, Valls added with a smile. How ironic. I think not. Sounds like the Old Testament god to me, grumpy old man who grumbles all the time. Destroys a few cities, sends a few plagues. The usual. My question is, taking the Granger as God fantasy a bit further, he stared down into his empty glass. Is he the Old Testament God of wrath and vengeance, or the New Testament God of salvation and redemption? After all, we've got several moons with holes bored into them, the ISS Chesapeake destroyed, hundreds, no, thousands of deaths already. She cut him off by leaning in. This is classified top secret, Tau 20. But you should know. You know the moon in the Jakarta sector, Talrishi. Yeah. An inhabited system, right? Except the Golgothic ship hit Talrisi with its beam while no one was looking? Right. She downed the last of her coffee. I just heard a few minutes ago. It's gone. He looked up suddenly. What do you mean, gone? Gone. Disappeared the whole moon. Debris? None. Vols puffed air in exasperation. You're the scientist. You tell me, is that possible? No. Let me get this straight. A thirteen-billion-year-old message from Granger, a piece from the victory just as old as the message, now an entire moon just, poof, disappears. What the bloody hell is going on? She shook her head. I wish I knew. Believe me, Balsy, I wish I knew. She was half tempted to wave the yeoman over to refill her cup, but the slight buzz she felt was enough. With the Dolmasi out there ready to spring on an unsuspecting system at any time, she had to stay ready for duty. It's like my mom always said, they come in threes. The bad things, the deaths, the catastrophes, whatever. They come in threes. My question is, after Granger's message and after Tal Rishi going missing, what the hell could follow that up? A shadow passed over Valls's face, and he looked like he wanted to say something, but he just played with his cup. Out with it. You've had way more than three, Shelby. Are you doing okay? I haven't heard you talk about Danny even once since you learned he was dead. We don't know for sure he's dead. She said the words, but they sounded hollow even to her. Danny Proctor. Barely twenty years old. Oldest son of her younger brother. Almost like her own son since she had helped raise him over the past ten years. And he was gone just months after finally achieving his dream of captaining his own starship, a merchant freighter named the Magdalena Issachar. But an unknown ship had intercepted it over Sangre de Cristo in the San Martin system, boarded it, killed Danny's crewmates, and detonated the freighter's cargo, a stolen nuclear missile, destroying one of the domed settlements on Sangre. They found Danny's charred spacesuit a hundred kilometers from the nearest domed settlement several days later. If you say so, Shelby. When you're ready to talk about it, I'm here. I haven't lost a child or a nephew like that, at least not exactly. But if you want to talk... I don't. Not yet. Fair enough. He spun his cop a few more times. Oh, Lieutenant Querty reports he figured out a new Domasi phrase as he listened in on their ligature comm traffic when the Skura showed up. That caught her interest and made her glad that Valls had the good sense to change the subject. Really? What? He cleared his throat dramatically. Oh, shit. She laughed. Ballsy could still make her laugh after all those decades. Well, tell Mr. Querty to keep at it. I want a full Domasi dictionary by the end of the week. And Commander Mumford is still working on the analysis of the sensor readings we took of the Golgothic ship before it plunged into Titan. He's having a hard go of it. Honestly, he needs more people. An actual science team. She nodded. I might still have some sway at IDF Sciences. I'll see if I can't pull some people in. Besides, I've got a few other things I want them to look into. I want our own people looking into the science of the metaspace pulse and its interaction with and effect upon the ligature. 
I want some extra eyes on the data we got on the Magdalena Issachar, just to confirm what Admiral Tigre's folks are telling me, and... She paused, considering. And I want to take another look at the black hole data. I know, I know, our top scientists have been studying the Penumbra black hole for three decades, but... I just want to... I don't know. Take another look? Study the interaction of those antimatter bombs that Tim piloted into that thing with the metaspace link the swarm supposedly used to enter our universe? There are issues of causality and interactions between quantum physics and general relativity physics that I'm not 100% clear on. And I also want... He started laughing. What? You know who you sound like? President Avery? Especially when you mentioned her antimatter bombs. She had dozens of different secret projects going on at once. Probably still has several of them going on right now, even though she's been out of office for 25 years. The whole antimatter bomb project, the Mars project, she called it, to confuse the Russians about what it actually was all about, was secret right up until we finally used them on what we thought was the Swarm's home world. And then again, a day later, when Tim ran a few of them into the Swarm's end zone like he was rushing with a football. But was that all Avery was working on in secret? I bet she had a dozen other things up her sleeve in case those bombs didn't work. You're the same, always thinking twenty steps ahead. Are you making fun of me? No, I'm complimenting you. I guess I'm just saying that, with you on our side and back in the game, as bleak as things seem, I can't help but think that our enemies have a freight train headed straight at them. A freight train called Shelby Proctor. He lifted up his glass and tipped it toward hers as a toast, and tried to drink before he remembered it was still empty. Well, I'll be a lot more at ease when we know what the third thing is, she said, circling back. A message from Granger, a moon disappearing, and then, as if on cue, her calm beeped. She shot Vols an unnerved look and pulled her hand terminal out of her pocket. Proctor, she said. Admiral? A small freighter is approaching and is requesting permission to dock. Her brow furrowed in mild surprise. Commercial freighter? Ah, affirmative. Permission denied. We don't have time for whatever they- I told them that, ma'am, but- Well, she says her name is Fiona Lou. Was really insistent that her name get passed on to you. Fiona Lou. Proctor's eyes bulged out. Her spine ran cold. Oh, my God. Vols mouthed to her, Who the hell is Fiona Lou? She replied into her hand terminal, Permission granted. Shuttle Bay 2, I'll meet her there. She stood up and rushed for the door. Vols followed close behind. Who the hell is Fiona Lou? He repeated. She didn't even pause as she responded. His girlfriend. Danny's dead girlfriend. Chapter 19. Orbit over Mao Prime, ISS Independence, Sickbay. Zivik paced, back and forth past the door to the surgical ward, stopping every now and then to peer in through the window, past the blinds, through the small half-centimeter gap between them and the window sill. Wait, were they done? Or were they just taking a break? He saw the surgeon step back from the operating table, frustration covering his face. His front was wet with blood. Damn it, damn it, damn it. You're hopeless, you know. He spun around at the sound of the voice. He didn't know whether to smile or glare at the voice's owner. Look, Jerusha. She was hanging by a thread out there. If we had been ten seconds later. He turned back to peer through the window while she sidled up next to him. How is she? In truth, he had no idea but the fact that they were still operating had to be a good sign, right? They've been in there for two hours. That's good, I suppose. If things were beyond hope, they'd have stopped by now. He leaned his head onto the window and closed his eyes. I lost Sarah Batak. I didn't realize how hard I'd fallen for her, and then when she died so suddenly, it just... I was just... completely floored. And now, saving Ace only to have her hit by a stray bullet, she grabbed his shoulders and twisted him to face her. Zivik, listen to me. You've got to stop this. Look, I know you. We nearly got married, remember? 
he managed a half-smile. Yeah. What do you say, give it another shot? She held a finger up to his lips. Shush. I'm not joking around, just listen. You've got a... problem, Zivik. You've got this image of yourself as this knight in shining armor, riding into the rescue to save the damsel in distress? Which is fine, whatever motivates you to do your best in battle and complete the mission, whatever. But you're taking it too far, Zivik. You saved Batak. You fell for her and she died. You had me, Zivik. You had me right in front of your nose and you couldn't commit. It wasn't until after I'd left that you realized what you lost. She smacked her forehead. Oh my god. I just realized. What? You? Your problem is that you only want what you can't have. Once you saw you couldn't have me, that's when you went off the rails, trying to impress me or whatever you were trying to do with that stunt that killed your mom and stepped at stop. And then Batak? You rode in to the rescue. You started having a thing going, and then she was taken from you abruptly, unfairly. And so you lionized her in your mind? Set her up on this angelic pedestal? You convinced yourself that it was a sure thing between the two of you when the truth is you barely knew her. There was no basis for a relationship there. Saving the girl doesn't get you the girl. You understand that, right? Just stop, she didn't let go of his shoulders. And now Ace. You're just smitten with her, aren't you? You saved the girl, and now she might die, and so you're pining over her. I am not. You are. Admit it, why else are you here? He felt his face getting red. Because she's a comrade. Pilots look out for each other. Really? Then why aren't you with Bucket? He got hit too. Didn't you know that? He, he did? Yeah, he just got out of surgery. Took a bogey's round right through his shoulder. Missed his aorta by an inch. But you didn't notice because you're hung up. Over the girl. His mom, Space Champ, always told him when he was a teenager that lies hurt. But the truth hurt much, much worse. And listening to Whitehorse made him cringe, made him angry, because he recognized the truth in the accusations. She somehow read his mind. Look, I'm not saying this to accuse you or hurt you or even to stop you from pursuing her. He faked another half smile. Gee, thanks. I'm only saying this to help you, Zivik. I hate seeing you get hurt over and over and over again. I'll be fine. He breathed deep and set his shoulders square. Really, I'm fine, Jerusha. Maybe I do have a thing for her, maybe not. And yes, I'll go check in on Bucket in a second. But I just had to know how she was doing. I can't keep losing people like this. He smiled again, this time a little more genuine. I'm fine. She let go of one shoulder but squeezed his other and smiled. One more thing you should know, Zivik? What? Ace has a girlfriend. He couldn't mask the expression creeping onto his face. Wait, what? Whitehorse started to walk away. His expression had apparently told her enough. You really know how to pick him. Just a comrade, huh? Oh shit, I shouldn't have told you that. You only want what you can't have, which means now you're going to fall for Ace even harder. He scowled. Damn it. Come on, let's go check on Bucket. I'll take a rain check, she replied, backtracking through the door back into the main ward. I've got to get back up to the bridge. Tell him hi for me. He watched her start to leave and saw beyond the door that the main ward was full of wounded from the skirmish with the Dolmasi and that Bucket, his fellow pilot, was indeed laying bedridden in the corner, an IV hanging above him. Wait, Jerusha, do you know the stats from the battle? How many did I get? She eyed him, then glanced down at her data pad that she kept with her at all times. Lieutenant Ethan Batship Zivik, confirmed kills? She looked back up at him. Eight. So, not 101? Not today, Batship, maybe next time. She turned and retreated back to the main ward. He followed her out and parked himself in a chair at Bucket's bedside while Whitehorse left sickbay. Maybe next time, Batship, he said to no one. Chapter 20 Orbit over Mao Prime ISS Independence Shuttle Bay 
The freighter looked new, and if Proctor didn't know any better, she might have thought it was actually an IDF supply ship, based on its aggressive angles and pockets that looked like they might have at one point housed weapons. If it was once a military ship, all identifying marks had been removed. She wondered what she'd find if she had a tech crew examine the transponder data files. Perhaps the ship was stolen from IDF and repurposed as a private cargo freighter. The freighter's hatch opened. Proctor waited in the shuttle bay's anteroom, watching on the monitor as the freighter's ramp descended and the squad of marines positioned themselves to greet the visitor. And, of course, check her for weapons, bombs, anything that would pose a threat to the admiral or the ship. She stepped down the ramp. At least Proctor assumed it was a she. The figure wore a mask, almost like a vacuum-rated flight suit. A corporal shouted some orders to her and she raised her arms. The marine stepped forward and frisked her, checking her pockets, then waving a scanner over her body. Several minutes later, the marine turned to the camera and nodded. Proctor pressed on the comm. Bring her in here, corporal. The door to the anteroom slid open and Lou walked through, accompanied on either side by a marine, along with one ahead of her and two behind. Proctor stood in the center of the room, facing her, arms folded. When the guards finally paused, forcing Lou to stop several paces away, she noticed that not only was the other woman's helmet still on, but the oxygen was flowing. That set alarm bells off in the back of her mind, contingencies and possibilities starting to play out in her mind's eye. Was the woman going to gas them all? Is that why she was still wearing her helmet? No. The Marine's scan was thorough. They would have detected something like that. But Proctor remembered her dead nephew's former girlfriend had worked several years as an IDF intel field agent. If she was planning something, it was likely to be undetectable. You're not dead, said Proctor. Lou, rather than respond, started fiddling with her helmet, releasing the clasps and thumbing the oxygen flow off. The Marines nearby raised their weapons and swung them up towards her, making her freeze. Proctor waved. No, go ahead, take it off. The helmet came off, and Proctor gasped. Most of her face looked like it had melted. Her hair was gone. The only picture she had seen of the woman was the one in her service file, essentially an unsmiling mugshot. The woman standing before her bore little similarity to that picture, except for the unsmiling part. In fact, Proctor wasn't sure if it was the ghoulish effect from the melted skin but it looked like Lou was either snarling or grimacing. Oh, my God, said Proctor. What happened? That looks recent. Oh, she added, the pieces suddenly falling into place. Admiral Mullins had said Lou was dead, killed in the blast at Centcom Bolivar that was supposedly meant for her, for Proctor. But he was wrong, or lying because clearly the woman standing in front of her was not dead, though it looked as if she may have been at one point. My apologies, Admiral. The helmet keeps the environment around my face at optimum temperature and humidity, and flows trace amounts of antiseptics and regrowth hormones across my skin. It's a compromise. It allows me to be up and moving and not in a hospital bed. Proctor couldn't help but stare at the ruined face. I can't imagine any sane doctor would let you out like that. A month in the hospital at least. Like I said, compromise. The doctor let you out? Lou's glare was cold and hollow. The doctor would have killed me. Hippocrates be damned. He was Mullins's man, after all. You work for Mullins, said Proctor. It was a statement, not a question. Her scowl darkened. Worked, clarified Lou. Pieces of the puzzle shuffled in her mind. Proctor assembled them into one solution, then shook them up into another. But the problem was that she still lacked key pieces. Mullins tried to kill you, not me. Oh, I'm sure he wouldn't have minded if you'd died too. 
He claimed to like you, but as a field agent I was trained extensively on how to tell when people are lying. And I'm pretty sure Mullins doesn't like you in the slightest. Every one of her words looked like it pained her, like the act of speaking was pure torture. Proctor imagined stretching that ruined skin into speech, the bare muscles and tendons forming tortuous words was pure hell. Why would Mullins want you dead? Liu finally smiled. In her mind, Proctor could almost hear the other woman's skin crackle with the strained motion. Because I know too much. I know far, far too much. Chapter 21 Orbit over Mao Prime ISS Independence Armory Marine number two checked his assault rifle one final time and then felt his vest to make sure he had the two extra magazines. He nodded to Marine number one. Marine number three and number four gave him the thumbs up. They were all ready. They were nameless. Marine number two was his name now. He needed to be untraceable, without history, and no commanders they were operating solo. At least that was the story if they were, in the event that everything went tits up, captured. But the little pouch on his chest would be the insurance against that unhappy possibility. He tapped his own and nodded to Marine Number Two's chest pocket. We just received the go-ahead. You got your good night, Moon? Ain't good night moons, they're good night suns. As in good night, son, you're dead. The gravity of the statement weighed on him, but he knew what he was getting into. He signed up for it. Danger was the name of the game in this line of work, and for his employer, well, death was a small price if they achieved what they came for. Marine number one nodded. All right, let's get this show on the road. Four, get to engineering. Three, shuttle bay. Two, with me. They could hear the other Marines training through the wall. The training simulator had a firing range, and the rest of the men were lingering there as usual. That's where this group of Marines tended to linger after their training session was done. Firing big guns was therapeutic, after all, and they were at war. They deserved every bit of therapy they could get. But it was showtime. The signal indicated they needed to act quickly, and so they left the training simulator's locker room, stalked out into the hall, and locked the door behind them. Chapter 22 Orbit over Mao Prime, ISS Independence, Sick Bay. Proctor had finally convinced the newcomer to go to Sick Bay, which Liu acquiesced to on the condition that the Admiral accompany her, which was perfectly fine with Proctor, since the former IDF intel agent seemed to be at the center of recent events. How is she, Doc? Patel had shooed Proctor out of the examination room when they'd first arrived and now the doctor had finally emerged ten minutes later with a scowl covering his face. Really, Shelby, Dr. Patient Confidentiality. He snapped a glove off his hand and into the recycle receptacle. Cut the bullshit, Doc. Didn't stop you from telling both Babu and Ballsy about my frickin' tooth. Technically, she's dead according to IDF records, so legally you're fine on a technicality. But even if you weren't, I can invoke... He waved his still-gloved hand. Uh, stop. You sound like a first-year ensign, threatening to quote regulations at me. Your concerns for her would be touching if I didn't know that you've been avoiding me like the plague for the past two weeks. Stop changing the subject. It's a damn root canal. It can wait until after the apocalypse. She sighed in exasperation. Look, Patel, we've known each other a long time. Patel had finally snapped the other glove off and was washing his hands. Yes since I interned on the Chesapeake thirty years ago, and you were as stubborn then as you are now. He turned the water off and flicked his hands mostly dry before wiping them on his scrubs. And since I know how stubborn you are, I'll save us the time. He looked up toward the ceiling as if about to talk through the calm. Patient notes, Lieutenant Fiona Liu, preliminary examination. Patient displays extreme third-degree burns over approximately fifty percent of her body. 
as well as lacerations and contusions consistent with a detonation or other explosive event. Rudimentary medical attention has already been administered, though at this late stage of recovery, patient will likely require extensive skin grafts, since scar tissue has already formed. Proctor held up a hand. But Doc, what about her supposed death? I need to know if she's telling the... While she spoke, the doctor glanced all around the room, turning every which way without looking at Proctor. The message was clear. You're not here. Must be ghosts in here, he grumbled. Continue patient notes for Fiona Liu. Patient also shows trace amounts of experimental compound HG-1862, suggesting that at one point she may have either intentionally or unintentionally slowed her heart rate down to approximately two beats per minute and entered a state of limited consciousness. For what reasons, I can't fathom. Other than the burns and the superficial tissue damage, patient is otherwise in excellent health, consistent with a normal 28-year-old woman. Recommended recovery regimen, skin regrowth hormones, probably Domejan 5A, given patient's youth, as well as disaclopropathol for inflammation, acetaminophen for pain management. Proctor nodded. Thank you, Doc. He jolted and snapped around towards her. How the hell did you get in here? She smiled and pat his arm as she opened the door to the examination room where Lou was waiting. Nice, Patel. I promise you can rip this damn tooth out soon. You know, as soon as we save civilization. Again. She pulled the door shut behind her. He's... odd, said Lou once the door was closed. Yes, agreed Proctor. You have no idea. She pulled a chair over and sat across from the former intel officer, her dead nephew's girlfriend. Former girlfriend? She realized she had no idea what exactly was the nature of their relationship, whether it had ended or was in fact progressing by the time Danny had died. Okay. Talk. What first? Trust verification first, she thought. Proctor realized she needed to give her a few questions that she already knew the answers to, just to make sure Lou was telling the truth. It was no guarantee against deception, but it was something. How did you escape? How did they think you were dead? Lou nodded. When the blast hit, I already suspected Mullins wanted to get rid of me. I had guessed too much about his plans, and that unnerved him. So when the blast hit, it knocked me out for several minutes, I think. But when I came to, I swallowed a good night moon. I'm sorry, a what? A good night moon. It's a little pill they used to give us in the service for contingencies. Lowers your heart rate to almost nothing. Most of your cells go into temporary hibernation, but you actually stay partially awake, just enough to be aware of what's going on around you and enough where you can force yourself to snap out of it if you're in danger. So basically, when the ER doc on Bolivar looked at me, he pronounced me dead. And when no one was looking, I bolted, grabbed the first ship I could find, and got the hell out of Dodge. So at least that checked out. Proctor had feigned ignorance on the goodnight moon pill, but she knew very well that its active ingredient was, as Doc Patel put it, compound HG-1862. Proctor leaned forward. Fiona, I understand you were... Involved with Danny Proctor, my nephew. Liu's expression hardened. I was. She asked the question she wasn't really sure she wanted an answer to. Tell me, was he GPC? Was my nephew a terrorist? Terrorist? Danny? Of course not. He was sweet and kind. I... I'm ashamed to say it, but... She grimaced. Mullins 
assign me to infiltrate the GPC, and Danny was my way in. It started off that way, but after I got to know him, well, my training went out the window. I got involved. It was pretty steamy there for a few months before we decided to pull back a bit. So you used my nephew to infiltrate the GPC? She answered immediately, not a trace of shame on her face. Yes. She was a professional. Proctor could give her that. And what did you learn? That the GPC is basically what it claims to be. They wear their intentions and goals on their sleeve. Nothing underhanded going on. What they say is true. They're working for independence from U.E. or whichever world wants it. There are a few affiliated groups who are more militant and mostly outside of Secretary General Curiel's control. But the GPC itself is on the up and up. And Mullins, what does he want? Lou's face looked cold at the mention of the name. Mullins. War. He wants war. Why? Liu blew out a puff of air in exasperation. Hell if I know. He didn't exactly give me the bad guy monologue before he tried to kill me. But you have a better idea than anyone right now of what he's after. Speculate. Liu closed her eyes. Mullins is ego-driven. I mean, he wants money and power just as much as the next guy. But Mullins thrives on being the guy at the top. He needs it, craves it, and so he's positioned himself through his connections as an idea admiral to being not only the head of Shovik Orion, but essentially the strong man of Bolivar. They've got a president, of course, but he's basically Mullins's puppet. And through his leadership at Shovik Orion, he fantastic.